Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin the uh, session. My name, is <laughs> My name is Robert Hackman. I'm a professor in the Department of Nutrition at the University of California, Davis. Uh, UC Davis, you may or may not know, has the largest agriculture research program in the United States and the largest university research program in agriculture in the whole world. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a tea research program at UC Davis yet, but we do have a global tea initiative, and our um, founder, Catherine Burnett, was here talking earlier today about our efforts to promote global tea around the world. So it's a great honor for me to be here today. Let me get right into it. I have a lot to talk about today on the topic of the nutrition science of tea. Uh, as an outline, first I want to talk about a bit of tea biochemistry, not, not in too much detail. Uh, mostly focus on the research challenges. Why don't we have an abundant body of literature on tea? Uh, talk about some of the newer studies and then some uh, closing comments. It's a bit like preaching to the choir to me here because we all know that tea is good for you, right? But I'm a professor, I teach PhD students, and I tell them, don't just give me a story, show me some data. And we, I can, we all can point to a great amount of stories, but when it comes to the actual data, it's sorely lacking. So that's what I want to talk about today, uh, a bit why and some of the challenges that we face. Uh, certainly, in terms of the history, I don't know if you buy into the folk myth that the emperor had the tea leaves falling on his uh, hot cup of water when uh, he was out hiking and that was the discovery. I don't know. I wasn't there. But um, certainly we know that the use of the leaf of Camellia sinensis has been useful in traditional health care practices for thousands and thousands of years. It did first start as a medicine, and only later, hundreds of years later, did uh, the consumption of tea be used as a beverage. Uh, first for the uh, imperial families in China and Japan, and later for, for the common folks. When it comes to tea, and we actually start looking at the biochemistry, more than a thousand different compounds exist in a tea leaf. So for example, uh, we have these ca categories called flavonoids, which I'll talk about uh, the catechin, specifically EG, CG being the primary one. But there's also a set of unique polyphenols, carbohydrates in tea that also seem to have some bioactivity. Uh, I'll speak later about the important amino acid theanine, which is helpful for brain biochemistry and found particularly rich in matcha. Uh, green tea. We also know that uh, teas, depending upon how they're grown and uh, brewed, have met the methyl xanthine, caffeine, the alertness uh, compound. But there's also vitamins in there, there's minerals in there, and hundreds of different flavor and aroma compounds. And we're just beginning to understand that when we smell something, it can actually trigger hormones in our intestinal tract to start doing biological responses that we know very little about yet. But I think it's a useful frontier for what's uh, coming. Let me talk a little bit about uh, how the tea leaf is made into different teas. And certainly with an expert like Nigel sitting in the audience, this is very simple compared to the real science. But just for the sake of a quick overview, uh, please forgive me for uh, Ma making it uh, a bit brief. So uh, the green tea leaf can be uh, steamed, pan fried, dried, and you get one type of green tea. If the leaves are withered, which starts a biochemical reaction, and then um, partially oxidized, or sometimes in China, they'll call it partially fermented, because the Chinese word for fermentation is very similar to the Chinese word for oxidation, and those two terms are linked. But we know, uh, we, we, uh, the view in Western science is it's oxidized because fermentation is a bacterial process that's uh, germane to poor 
tea production, but not for the oxidation um, like uh, oolong tea or the oxidation when it's fully done uh, to black tea. And you can see from my uh, graphics here that green tea is particularly rich in this compound, EGCG, and other um, fit relatively small molecular weight compounds. But when we start oxidizing the uh, leaf, either partially or fully, uh, these, the, these, basically these three ring uh, structures start to polymerize. You see one three leaf here, one three ring here, another three ring here, polymerize uh, into a dimer, which would be uh, usually unique to, um, just lost my pointer. The, uh, the dimer is unique to oolong tea, and then the more complex uh, poly polymers for uh, black tea. The important point in terms of nutrition science is, uh, the important point for nutrition science is our body can absorb a molecule about this size. Our body may be able to absorb some of this, but these compounds are far too big to get across the intestinal tract. And so if um, them um, into our body. Uh, polyphenols are a very broad category of compounds. More than 8,000 different polyphenols exist. Some polyphenols are toxic and some polyphenols are nutritionally valuable. So to hear a company, whether it be a tea company or a food or beverage company say, our product is rich in polyphenols, doesn't, real, doesn't mean much to me except they don't know what they're talking about. So let me get a little bit more specific. Um, the, uh, the, the chart here is showing polyphenols, so we're going to go to phenolics, and then more specifically I want to talk about the flavonoid category, and when it comes to tea, I want to talk even more specifically about the flavanol category, and then even more specifically in this flavanol category, uh, these compounds, EGCG being the primary one in uh, tea, uh, minus epicatechin being the primary one in cocoa, which is where much, most of the research in this category has been conducted. Many different flavonoids exist in uh, a variety of vegetables and fruits. So, like I said, I want to focus on the flavanol category, which, uh, again, this three-ring structure shown here, uh, you find in cocoa, red wine, apples, and um, tea. I know it's hard for me to do research at UC Davis, but I am blessed because these are the, comp these are the foods I get to study uh, for my career. And it's like, well, you know. not that I'm against the other things, but... Um, the flavanols have some wonderful flavors as well as uh, health benefits. Like I've said, most of our understanding about how these flavanols work come from the literature and research done on cocoa. Uh, and so we know in general when it comes to plants that plants that are uh, challenged either by sunlight or temperature changes, lack of water, uh, herbivores, parasites, pathogens, the, the plants uh, get stressed and as part of their stress response they make these secondary metabolites in response to the stress and it turns out that these secondary metabolites are bioactive. Uh, again for cocoa it's primarily minus epicatechin and uh, we also know from now 20 years of research, much of it done at UC Davis in my department, that these compounds, particularly minus epicatechin, are involved in the cardiovascular system for improved function. These, the, the flavanol compounds improve blood flow, they relax the blood vessels, they reduce the stickiness of the platelets, the cells floating around in your bloodstream that are involved in clotting, and uh, we also understand that this compound works primarily by producing a gas called nitric oxide. Sounds good. Oh, sorry. Um, 
this is my opportunity to say that we know that minus epicatechin works primarily by uh, producing a gas called nitric oxide, which tends to relax the smooth muscles around the blood vessel. Right? So that is very clear. What we also know very clearly is that these compounds do not work by being antioxidants. And so even though I tore the floor here and <coughs> hear many people say, oh, our tea is rich in antioxidants, I, I have to just tell you frankly, that's a really nice concept, but don't just tell me a story, show me some data. And when we actually look at the data, the antioxidants in tea are so minimal relative to what's required for a biological response that it's probably not antioxidants. Secondly, the antioxidant testing is done in a little test tube. And why would you think that what happens in the little test tube is the same thing that's happening in my very complex, very antioxidant redundant body? It doesn't work that way. So ORAC values or TRAP or FRAP or these other uh, in vitro measures of antioxidants, are, are it, it's a nice story, but scientifically we're, we're past that. That was, a la that was last generation. Unfortunately, the food and beverage companies have made such a great effort to educate the consumer that antioxidants are good for you, that that's what people understand. So it's a, it's a great story, but um, it's not really that scientifically accurate. <coughs> now I talked about Epicatechin and uh, some work that was published a few years ago by my colleagues uh, actually fed minus Epicatechin and then traced the metabolites over a course of 48 hours. And you can see that um, the compound, here's that three ring compound, you can see that it gets chemically modified and then it gets uh, di disassembled and after 48 hours usually the uh, residual is excreted. So we know that the compounds, these flavanols, start to get metabolized even in the mouth. And by the time they're actually active in the body, they are no longer the compound that you put in your mouth. They've been metabolized into active compounds. So uh, one of the key points I'll make later is just because you put it in your mouth doesn't mean that it's going to be biologically active. Transformations happen, and it's the metabolites of the building block, the substrate, the base compound, that become the active uh, uh, players in our body. Another key point, again derived from the minus epicatechin literature, uh, has to do with the fact that mice, rats, and humans metabolize these flavanols very differently. So in this study, also uh, done uh, by my colleagues at Davis, they fed minus epicatechin to mice, they fed it to rats, and they fed it to humans. And then they took blood samples over that 48-hour period this is a, an accumulation. So uh, the blood samples can be processed in a way to isolate the flavanols and then uh, dropped on a machine called an HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography unit, uh, to identify what um, the actual chemical actors are based on the known standards that are put in the machine. And so every time you see a peak, that's one of the metabolites of epicatechin. Now look at the difference between a mouse, a rat, and a human. So let's just say uh, here, let's just take, um, well, let's just take this peak. I see it in human. I see it in a mouse. Wait a minute, it's not in a rat. Oh, let's take, uh, let's take, let's take this peak. It's, I see it in a rat. I see it in a mouse. Wait a minute, I don't see it in a human. What does that mean? What are the implications? for the research results in the future directions. And the implications are, if you want to know how it works in a human, you can't test it in a mouse. Now, I'm the first to recognize that I don't want to donate my liver or my brain tissue to find out where these metabolites went to. So mouse and rats have their role, but only as preclinical evidence for doing human testing. The challenge that I faced after 20 years of trying to get 
T research funded is, the cost of doing human studies is about three to five times higher than the cost of doing an animal study. And so um, that's become a bit of a challenge. But nonetheless, the science is what it is. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the same type of understanding for T or EGCG that we do for minus epicatechid. Uh, this is primarily due to the fact that the Mars company, which is one of the largest chocolate vendors in the world, M&Ms, confections, etc., uh, has partnered with UC Davis for close to 20 years now. And after, I don't know, I don't really know the number, but I'm estimating after about $20 million of research investment, I can show you this slide. Well, unfortunately, we don't have that type of opportunity in the tea world yet. But someday, I, I think there's hope. OK, so that's the understanding for cocoa. When we look at the same thing for tea, we know that the same environmental factors that challenge the tea plant uh, can produce more of these flavanols or, or secondary metabolites in general. And the secondary metabolite primarily in tea is this one, EGCG. We also know that caffeine exists, uh, again, depending upon how the plant is grown and processed. But EGCG is the primary one. You can see the three ring structure here and this extra gallate compound uh, side chain. The problem is we don't know. We don't know the next step with the T compounds like I could show you with the cocoa compounds. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. I've, I've seen plenty of reports that T is good for your cardiovascular system. Yes, I've seen them too. But I'll show you a little bit later that surveying populations about what they drink and trying to link that to vascular health is very diff that's an epidemiological study. That's very different than I feed a compound or I give you a beverage and I can see in the lab improvement in your blood flow in your hand, which is what we do with the cocoa work. So that's the big unknown and that's where I think, at least in terms of research, uh, one of the opportunities are. I also mentioned that polysaccharides are another component of tea and you can see just from this graph that uh, tea polysaccharides are promoted for being anti-aging on the skin, helping with blood sugar regulation, immune boosting, uh, support liver, cancer uh, risk reduction, oxidative stress, anti-obesity, improving immunity. It sounds great. Tell me a story. Don't just tell me a story. Show me some data. And unfortunately, these uh, are lacking data, but they um, have some great stories behind them. We need to know which polysaccharides, because hundreds of them exist, depending upon how the tea is grown and processed, how much you have to drink, how often do you have to drink it, and in whom is it going to be helpful for. Now, maybe you're saying, well, I want to reduce my risk for cancer, so I don't really care about all of this. I'm just going to drink green tea every day as a preventive measure because it's good for me anyway. I like the taste, and I don't want to wait 20 years for those darn scientists to figure out the mechanism, I'm going to drink it now and, and enjoy it. To which I say, enjoy every sip of it. Why is studying tea so challenging? So here are some other easy considerations. What do we mean by tea? <clears throat> what am I supposed to study? Green tea, oolong tea, black tea, poor tea. And then, or white tea, and then which green tea, and which poor tea, and which oolong tea. And, you, and because different processing, certainly we can taste the difference. So there's probably different chemicals in there too. So which one am I supposed to study when it, it, it comes to tea? And I've already shown that the different brewing methods have different uh, compounds that are produced. And I've made this point, so I'll just say briefly again, in order to know the effects in humans, testing has to be done in humans. <laughs> and while that's great in theory, as I mentioned, it's rather expensive. <clears throat> Another key consideration about studying tea, as, as I've already started talking about, is this idea of the transformation 
of the T catechins happen as soon as they hit the GI tract. So the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, starts in the mouth. And we actually have uh, enzymes in our saliva that start breaking down the T polyphenols. <clears throat> uh, stomach is mixing and churning. But here in the small intestine, duodenum and jejunum, is where a lot of the uh, breakdown of the T polyphenols happen, get absorbed. And then th those that aren't broken down uh, go into the colon, which get further metabolized. I'm going to show you a uh, slide about that in a minute. Uh, so, uh, but before that, let me just mention that in our colon, we have trillions of microbes living inside of us. <clears throat> you've, maybe you've heard the term, the gut microbiome. So the T polyphenols that are not digested upstream in the small intestine come down here into the colon and those bacteria can break down the T polyphenols into those small molecular weight compounds and that gets absorbed in a secondary uh, absorption compared to the primary absorption here the secondary absorption happens in the large intestine <laughs> and as I mentioned already the relationship between what goes in the mouth and what is active in the body is actually a very complex phenomenon because of this concept called digestion. Uh, and here's another um, graphic. I just pulled the same text from last slide. <clears throat> so, um, like I said, the small intestine can break down the T polyphenols. You get absorption into the portal vein that takes it to the liver. Those that are not absorbed go into the colon where bacteria can break down the polyphenols further and those get absorbed and they go into the liver, sent out to the tissues such as the cardiovascular system uh, for bioactivity and then eventually excreted in the urine. It's not like a vitamin or a mineral or a pharmaceutical where you give a known compound and you can trace it through the body, through the activity, into the feces, into the urine, and map out the whole process uh, for polyphenols, flavanols. It's much more specific. <clears throat> well, with that as an overview, let me talk about some of the exciting, at least to me exciting, new research on uh, tea. <clears throat> uh, this study was published out of the, uh, it was, it was is, is in the British Journal of Nutrition, but it's out of the UK looking at tea consumption and all-cause mortality. Mortality is death. Uh, and so here's the data for green tea and for black tea. Uh, ignore, ignore the dashed lines, those are just the standard deviation around the mean. So look at the mean, uh, the, the solid line here, and basically the summary is for every one cup per day increment in green tea, it was associated with a 5% lower risk of cardiovascular disease mortality, 4% lower risk of all-cause mortality. Uh, so you can see probably it, it starts to plateau down here at around three cups a day. So at least three cups a day looked like it was really good. After that, <clears throat> it's more or less uh, the same. For black tea, the response is quite different, right? All-cause mortality decreased to two and a half, decreased to about two and a half cups, and then look at this. Right? Now, does that mean that people who drink a lot of black tea are putting themselves at risk? Who knows? Does, it even, does any of this even tell us what the compounds in the tea are doing in the body? And the answer is no. It's simply telling us people who drink green tea are this, people who drink black tea are that. People who drink green tea, come on, maybe they're eating more fruits, maybe they're eating more vegetables, maybe they're getting more sleep, maybe they're just taking more time to relax and enjoy their tea. And those factors improve the heart health. Maybe the people drinking eight cups of black tea in the UK, for all I know, they're also smoking. And they're also sedentary. And they're also eating junk food. So we can't tell from this data that green tea is good, black tea a little bit is bad. It just is a pattern in the population. <clears throat> uh, th these studies are, are a compilation of uh, 13 other studies 
uh, looking at blood pressure and green tea intake. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, systolic blood pressure is the high number that is the force when the heart ejects the blood. And uh, here shows the list of all the studies that were assessed and you can see briefly uh, the drop in blood pressure for each of the studies that's shown here. But the real operative information is the little diamond, which is the summary of all of these 13 above. And you can see that um, for, it says favors green tea. So if zero is neutral, it looks like it's about, well, it's specifically, it's minus 2.05 millimeters of mercury drop in blood pressure is the summary of these uh, 13 studies. <clears throat> But most importantly is the benefits were primarily in people that already had moderately high blood pressure. So in other words, if your blood pressure is normal, at least by these data, you're probably not going to see much of a drop because how can you improve when you're already normal? The idea is if you're not normal, we want to bring you back to normal. And that's uh, why, because 130 is usually up the upper accepted limit, uh, at least for a person my age. For a younger person, it's even 120 is the upper accepted limit. The data on diastolic blood pressure, which is the second number in your blood pressure readings after the heart uh, relaxes, the residual blood pressure in the system is there. And you can see <coughs> this diamond is a, a drop of 1.71 millimeters of mercury. Not a whole lot, certainly not as much as a pharmaceutical could do, but I would say if you're concerned about blood pressure, by all means, why not? It wouldn't hurt. I don't know if it would help that much, but every little bit helps, doesn't it? <laughs> A study just came out this past month looking at people who substituted tea or coffee, well, excuse me, uh, looking at people who drink tea or coffee compared to people who drink sugar-sweetened beverages. Right? So this is a compilation from eight studies in Europe that uh, assessed over 27,000 people for uh, quite some number of years. <coughs> Again, an epidemiological study. In the population that they studied, they had over, uh, oh, sorry, dropped it. It was 12,336. I don't know where the, my six went. It's probably still out there drinking tea and not in here. I don't know. Uh, 12, 000, over 12,000 people that had type 2 diabetes and what they found was drinking tea rather than the sugar sweetened beverage uh, estimated to lower the risk of diabetes by 22 percent. <laughs> and you can see the graph here, uh, the cumulative incidence estimated of diabetes uh, over the number of years and so for the, for the sugar sweetened beverages that would be things like uh, sodas. Uh, the, the, the line breaks out very clearly. Milk, fruit juice is moderate. And then coffee and tea, there was actually no difference between coffee or tea. Both of them reduced the risk of diabetes by in 21 and 22 percent for coffee and tea respectively. I've already talked with some of the vendors out here about how do we get people to stop drinking Coca-Cola and start drinking tea. And some of you may know the answers better than me. I think it has to do with the number one rule of nutrition, which is it's got to taste good. Health benefits are nice, but for most people, we choose our foods and beverages based on taste. And so if we can provide more delicious teas to people, maybe that will shift the needle, but I do recognize it's hard to compete with a hundred million dollar a year advertising budget that Coca-Cola has. And I don't see a tea company sponsoring the Olympics. So that's what we're up against, but slowly but surely by events like this, I think we're going to make some progress. Plus also uh, hopefully people recognize that sugar sweetened beverages are not good for you. Anyway, let's move on. Um, a lot of uh, talk about green tea and cancer. I've heard it from at least five or six of the vendors out here already today. But let's look at the actual data on that. And I, 
I could pull a few studies. The best one is the one I'm going to highlight here, this 11-year study of um, over 8,000 men and women. They surveyed green tea intake, but this was done in Japan, where the cup size in Japan is half the cup size of what you and I know in the US. Right, so we have to do the adjustment calculation. They also measured uh, the smoking data, and then they looked at the cancer rate. So again, in Japan, a cup size is there. Our cup size is here, unless you go, and I know I'm in the land of Starbucks here, but nonetheless, unless you go to an obscene amount of uh, there. So we're looking at adjusting the numbers to four ounces. And you can see, this is showing uh, females and males, daily consumption of green tea less than three, four to nine or more than 10 cups a day. So average age of onset of cancer percent of patients. So less than three, the average age for a female was 67. If she drank four to nine, the average age onset was 66. But if she drank more than 10, she didn't get cancer until she was 74 compared to 67. Now, to me, that's pretty significant. So that's 10 cups of this amount of tea. <coughs> For men, you can see 65, 67, 68, really no difference there at all. 10 cups a day, men, no significance that could be found. <clears throat> we, I, I talked with a couple of vendors today about why people drink green tea for the cancer risk. And so I, 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 know, I, I know enough about cancer from my research on medicinal mushrooms and cancer to know that by the time you get cancer, it's kind of late. You know, the, then, then the, the strategy is kill the cancer and make sure it doesn't spread. But preventatively, we're talking about 20, 30, 40 years. And to do those kinds of studies are, are very challenging. And um, again, I would just say, if, if immune support is important to you and cancer risk reduction is important, by all means, drink green tea and enjoy every sip of it. But will there be a cause and effect guarantee? Probably not. <clears throat> Let me move on and talk about uh, the uh, key amino acid called threonine and its role in mood and cognition. Cognition is mental focus and attention. Uh, theanine is an amino acid that changes a brain biochemical building block called dopamine, one of the key neurotransmitters in our body associated with relaxation as well as mental focus. And it turns out that uh, theanine is found in green tea and it's found particularly in matcha green tea. And that ha has to do with the fact that during the cultivation of the tea leaf, usually in the last three or four weeks, these shade cloths are put over the tea fields. And so the, the reduction in the sunlight stimulates the plant to make more theanine. It also makes more caffeine. But I just find it fascinating that cultivation can increase the amount of a brain biochemical building block. <coughs> now, as I'm sure this audience knows, uh, with matcha the entire leaf is consumed, not the stem and the veins, but the entire leaf is consumed. So it's more of a vegetable than a, a, a tea or tea same, right? Because you're, you're consuming the fiber and the other components in the tea leaf, so it's not just matcha and caffeine. And so the nutritional considerations are a little bit different than drinking, say, green tea. Fiber is also an element in matcha, although relative to the 25 grams of fiber we need, need every day, you'd have to drink a lot of matcha to make an impact on fiber intake. Is it a brain superfood? I don't know. But I predict within the next five years, there's going to be an explosion of interest in matcha because 
of this theanine and caffeine connection. More, would you be interested in men more mental focus? The challenge with matcha is, you know, it's great to come here and drink a little sample of it, but are you really going to drink that every day? And so a lot, uh, and, and I'll tell you, for me, the answer is no. Uh, but I, so a lot of R&D research and development in, by food companies are going into how to get matcha into food. And I'm not talking about matcha green tea ice cream. Or, or, or frosted donuts with matcha frosting on it. But um, matcha can be uh, included into uh, cookies or biscuits and other types of even savory food are now starting to uh, be developed that can have this matcha. And so that might be the savior for the matcha industry because in Japan, the sales of matcha are declining quite substantially as the young generation in Japan goes more for sugar-sweetened beverages and other types of uh, beverages. The research on matcha is, is still emerging. A couple of uh, newer studies have been published. This is looking at, in the drink, or like I mentioned, that snack bar format, format. And they showed some mild improvements in mood and cognitive performance. Uh, you, this is out of a, a food design group in the Netherlands, and uh, this study uh, showed that drinking matcha before women went out on a walk helped to burn about an extra 50 or 60 calories during the walk, which, you know, if you burn 2,000 calories a day, an extra 50 or 60 isn't that important on any one day, but if you add that up over the course of the month, it's a pound or two of fat. So there may be some um, newer studies coming out, but this is the current state of the art right now. <coughs> Lastly, a uh, few comments about green tea extract. So rather than drinking the tea uh, by chemical engineering to pull out that flavanol rich, that EGCG rich fraction and taking that extract and drying it and putting it in a pill and giving people the pill. Let's see what happens. And so this study out of the University of Minnesota <coughs> uh, gave capsules that were equal to drinking five eight ounce cups of green tea in terms of their EGCG equivalent. Uh, these postmenopausal women uh, consumed it every day for four months and then serum lipids, cholesterol, and lipoproteins were assessed. Uh, the data is uh, maybe a little bit more than you care to look at, but I'll just show you here that for total cholesterol, the numbers went down. And so for the green tea extract group, they started at 206, and after six months, it was down 6.64 units. And after 12, it was down 4.3. Here, the placebo started at 209, about the same here, but really no change. So a drop in total cholesterol levels in the green tea extract group. For HDL, the, the good cholesterol, um, there's unfortunately a, a bit of a drop there and a bit of a raise there. So that we don't really want to see a drop in good cholesterol, but I've never, never been involved in a research study where there aren't some results that you don't like. The bad cholesterol is more important, at least in terms of what your doctor is looking for. And the bad cholesterol, LDL, shows a very nice relationship. They started out in the green tea extract at 118, dropped by five or so uh, per points here, and basically no change in LDL in the control group. No, no real significance in triglycerides. So it, it shows some potential for uh, green tea extract, although many other natural products are out there to help lower cholesterol and lower LDL levels. Last, let me talk just very uh, briefly in closing about our work at UC Davis on the Global Tea Initiative. Um, we're now in our fifth year, and uh, the four pillars of the Global Tea Initiative at UC Davis 
are shown here to provide innovations in agriculture, uh, new studies on health and wellness, to promote the social good and to enhance cultural understanding. Um, our university is a uh, champion for all four of these pillars for uh, societal good. Our Global Tea Initiative, because we embrace both the biochemistry, plant science, humanities, uh, uh, and social sciences, um, is really the only comprehensive tea program in the world. I know some of you have been to UC Davis before, and um, I hope that if you haven't, that you'll be able to come next January, January 16th and 17th, for our two-day colloquium. The colloquium is free. I mean, that's free to come to the colloquium, not free for you to come from Seattle. I un understand that part. But um, the fifth annual colloquium will actually be a very robust discussion between is tea good for you? Is wine good for you? Which one is better for you? And I can already tell you now, they're both great for you, and you should enjoy every sip of them. And if you're going to drink wine, make sure it's California or Washington or Oregon wine, and none of that foofy stuff from other countries. <clears throat> and that's because, at least for me, it's important to support our local farmers. And when it comes to local farmers, we're starting to see some local farmers growing tea and we want to help them so that someday we can have a robust tea industry in the United States like they do in China and Taiwan and Japan and Colombia and Kenya and those, uh, Sri Lanka and the other places where the tea comes from. Uh, we are a global tea initiative. Uh, these are some recent events that I've had the pleasure of being involved with. I gave a lecture last year in Hangzhou, China at the country's National Tea Research Institute uh, talking to about 70 of the top research scientists on plant biochemistry and health. Uh, I was in Hong Kong. Wing Chi Ip is one of the most famous uh, tea house owners in the world and one of our advisors at the Global Tea Initiative at UC Davis. So he hosted me and, and others in his tea house in Hong Kong. And I also had the pleasure of working with uh, uh, Dr. Bacon Ng who uh, has a day job as a doctor of physical therapy, but his other real job is he's one of the top seven tea tasters and rankers, evaluators for their, their tea competitions. And so what Bacon taught me in um, the tea house, and also Dr. Juan, who's sitting here, my host at the National Tea Research Institute, was when I asked him, how do you evaluate is tea, if, if, if tea is good for you. And Dr. Wan said, tea should feel good in your throat. And Bacon said, tea should relax your gums. Now, I, I don't know quite frankly what that feels like, but it, it's, it, it's, it's a good story. And so tea should feel good in your mouth and tea should feel good going down your throat. And if, if it doesn't, then find a different tea to drink. Let me summarize. I've talked about the chemistry of tea and the fact that it's much more complex than most consumers uh, realize. The health benefits of tea are challenging to quantify. I showed you some evidence today, but I've also illustrated that the information from population studies don't really identify tea as the active ingredient. They identify a lifestyle pattern that includes drinking tea. Tea extracts, I think, offer great promise in the future for health promotion, whether it's that EGCG extract that I've talked about, or possibly matcha and matcha extracts that have that theanine component to it. I think we can see some promising future for, for that as well. And lastly, I would just say, even though I've talked today as a scientist, enjoying tea is one of life's great pleasures. And so even if you don't know the science or care about the science, ah, just the smell and the aroma and the experience 
and hopefully the social interactions. What does that do for our health? It may be hard to quantify, but we all agree that it's really important. And so maybe the act of drinking and enjoying tea is the real benefit, and it's up to us biochemists to figure it out, the details, but so what? Let's just enjoy it and enjoy every sip of it. So with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you. The question has to do with if I put sugar in my tea, will that negate the benefits? And how does the sugar in my tea, which is usually less than in a can of soda, how, how does that compare? So first of all, let me illustrate how much sugar is in a can of soda. Imagine, you're just gonna have to hallucinate here with me for a minute. Imagine I have a bowl of sugar and a teaspoon and a glass, 12 ounces of water. One teaspoon of sugar. Two, um, how, how many teaspoons do I need to keep adding to get to what's in a can of Coca-Cola? Three, Sh should I keep going? Four, four, five, six, what, you're saying more? Seven, eight, nine teaspoons of sugar in a 12 ounce can of soda. Obviously, <coughs> well I don't know you, but for most of us, obviously we don't put that much sugar in our tea. So I don't know, I haven't seen studies of whether a, 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 a small teaspoon of sugar uh, negates the absorption of the polyphenols or what it does to interact with those tea polysaccharides. I don't really know that, but I can't imagine that a little bit of sugar is going to provoke a, a glycemic response, a blood sugar response, or, or cause much of a detrimental effect. On the other hand, I, like I said, the number one reason we consume foods and beverages, it has to taste good. So if a little sugar helps make it taste good and that gets you to drink more tea, go for it. <coughs> question here? The question has to do with the polyphenols in black tea rather than in green tea. Because I was able to illustrate a couple of studies about polyphenols in green tea and I only showed that data from the UK, the population study with black tea. Um, as, I, as I mentioned from the biochemistry, black tea ha has uh, the bioactive polyphenols polymerized. They're too big to be absorbed. And so in order to get the benefit of black tea, our digestive tract has to break apart those polyphenols. Uh, and the efficiency of that is variable between people. So that's, that's why it's hard to study black tea because it's not as well absorbed. And when it is absorbed, the building block that you put in your mouth is not what's floating around in your bloodstream. So in a way, it's just too complex. We haven't figured out how to study it yet. I know how to study it in theory, but that has to do with radioisotope labeled T. And we're just not there in our research yet. Please. The question has to do with whether theanine can re reduce the impact of caffeine. And is that a good story? Or, or, um, and the, the new research from the University of Shizuoka that I um, just mentioned in passing here, um, they're, they're actually looking at the theanine caffeine ratio and, and, look at, and linking it to uh, a, a relaxation response. And so their data is showing that theanine has to be at least twice the amount of caffeine in order to get that beneficial effect from matcha. And most matcha has theanine and caffeine around one to one rather than two to one. So um, that, that works just in the last year or two, how that translates into cultivation practices or grinding practices or, or we don't really know yet. Um, but certainly the theanine to caffeine ratio 
is very critical. Thank you for that topical question. Well, anyway, I'll stay around for um, any other questions. But uh, again, uh, drink to your health and enjoy uh, the, the conference. Thank you very much.